So I'm going to shut up. So I'll hand you over to James. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you to the organisers for putting me in this this sort of uh, management track. And thank you for coming along to see what I have to say about what uh, information security can learn about DevOps. So with a lot of these presentations, there's a, a ubiquitous, who am I? But I'm going to keep mine very short and, and move on. Um, I'm, I'm in on just LinkedIn, really, on a social media point of view. If you want to, if you want to connect up likely to, if you want to uh, carry on any conversations for anything that gets sparked up by what we see later, um, very welcome um, staying in contact with people. So my security, I've always been into pulling things apart and breaking things, but my, my route as a career, I was an IT manager, then a solutions architect, and then got a break in security. While I was driving around, I was thinking about when it's, who am I? And you live a completely legit life, and you're not trying to stay off the grid, stay out of the way of the hunted team. Um, while I was driving around, I thought of a few little things that are connected with who you are that you can't do anything about, really. Um, and so I popped them on my side, but that's not going to help me with the talk. So um, we'll have a quick look at my version of DevOps. It's be the, the, the buzzword for some people. Um, it's a culture and a movement that's been growing for a long time for other people. So I'll set the scene with um, where I've come to about DevOps. Then I'll throw in, whilst I've um, been working on some projects to bring DevOps ideas and toolings to the information security world, um, I've come across other people who are doing something similar, so I'll introduce some of that, and then we'll go on to look at really how I think information security from a security operations point of view um, could be done better using um, the ideas behind the DevOps movement. So, um, just, to, just to break it up. Yes, a disclaimer, these are, these are just my thoughts, uh, and you may not agree with them, but also I'm not in DevOps, and I'm not a DevOps historian. But one of the first things that got me into people discussing how uh, development, IT operations, and information security, and internal audit often don't work together was this work from Gene King, the guy behind the original Tripwire. And so in 2004, he'd been working on it since 2000, he put out the book Visual Ops. So quickly looking around the audience, I can see most of us were born in 2004, not always guaranteed. <laughs> um, but that's 12 years ago, so um, people weren't talking about DevOps 12 years ago. If you, um, ha this was when ITIL was becoming a very popular term for large companies that needed to get a grip on um, things going wrong in production through un unauthorized changes. And that's very much the focus of the Visible Ops, the yellow book. But he came back a couple of years later with some more research that um, looked at how information security fitted in the picture. So, um, at the moment, DevOps and DevSecOps is sort of the, the bringing the security element into the current culture and, and, and wording. But then in Visible Ops Security, as Henny was talking about how um, security needs to get involved. They need to police some of it, they need to set standards in some of it, and it's a really, really good read, um, for those who like reading. I just wanted to to read a little bit from the introduction. Um, it's a bit like being back at school, I just want to read from this textbook. But development projects may be constantly behind schedule, partly because information security requirements is added late to the project. To preserve the due date and budget, the information security requirements are ignored and marginalised. That's just one of the points of the introduction. But it's something that has been discussed for many, many years. It was being discussed for a long time before we managed to get this book out in 2008. But if we go back a little bit further and we look at culture change, this is um, an important book in the history as I've learned it. Now, back in 2004, 2005, I was working as um, the security and QA elements of projects that were adopting XP. And 
XP methodologies. And as it says here, it's about embracing change, and it's about social change, and it's about culture change. And it was getting away from um, the, the old way of designing something, coding it, building it, long, um, long periods of time before integrating things together and then spending a lot of effort on patching things up ready for production release, maybe one production or two production releases a year. This was about, let's have a new culture, introduce um, continuous integration ideas, pair programming ideas, test-driven security, uh, test-driven development, TDD. So this dates back to 1999. So the things that you see flying around LinkedIn in job adverts today in 2016, nothing new. 17 years ago, they were talking about culture change, which is now considered to be DevOps. But we can go a little bit back further, a little bit, I won't keep going back. Um, but the idea of a daily build, and a daily build with some testing, so the, the precursor to test-driven development, goes back to, well, this piece is um, the piece that discusses it, but it references the work about NT3 having a daily build. That's enough going backwards, I think. Um, when it comes to the continuous integration side, so DevOps is obviously um, often described as continuous delivery, continuous integration, continuous deployment. Uh, continuous integration, this is um, an excellent start on the um, advantages of continuous integration. And this was around the time that I was working in a, a shop that did um, daily bills and um, test on checking. So then the idea and the, of bringing the words Dev and Ops together to be DevOps really sort of to get some traction following this presentation um, in 2009. So this is seven years ago. So these ideas are not new, even though um, recruitment seems to be just jumping on it now. Continuous Delivery, the book, if you're into going back and reading books, this um, is the one of the go-to books for um, looking at bringing continuous delivery into the, your move, bringing development and operations closer together. And moving forward to 2012, so four years ago, this is when the security, um, so information security not liking what was getting thrown over the fence by um, DevOps and also the DevOps is about speed and scale and how fast can we get the new feature in which rubbed up badly against the old way of looking at information security um, stop at this gate and run all these tests if you're doing 10, 20, 30 deploys a day then the old um, things that worked when you were doing two or three releases a year with information security which no longer worked. So there's a lot of discussion then about how you bring security into the blend. Now, it's not everyone's style, but the parable, the going on a fic fictional journey, I mean, worked very well with religious concepts, the, 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 the parable, but in business writing, the parable, these two large images here, two quite famous parables on DevOps, and they both bring in an information security manager into the story. And it's a bumpy journey, but they start off in a bad place, they end up in a good place, and it's all down to the DevOps culture. And the reason for the two little books in the corner, this, this parable for teaching business leaders, um, that comes from things that work really well for the one minute manager, that one in particular is about not doing other people's work. And the goal, which is about efficiencies and flows and making things happen. And the storylines behind these, which are really relevant to um, improving quality and security of what you're pushing the production, follow the story of the goal very closely. And they, they credit it as being their inspiration. Just in case you get the slides and you want to go back and have a look at what I think has been driving the history 
DevOps and where it touches with security. These are some really useful things. Proper use of Git. Learning about Vagrant and Ansible. There are lots of, uh, and I'll come to some of the tools, um, lots of others that do these jobs. You've got your chefs, your puppets, your sets. You've got, uh, I don't know what else works in the Vagrant space, but um, scripting your VMs, that is. And the DevOps toolkit is very much about containers. Docker is very, um, Docker, Linux containers, and all the extra services that go around that, and service registration. Those all get a good mention in the, the toolkit book. So yeah, if you could, I, I'm very happy to share these slides. Um, and so that's why I made it clear, the kind of reference that take you on this DevOps meets security journey. And then 2016, um, you may, you, you may have these, you may have people who are talking about them, but this is doing things at scale Google style, and this is a fantastic coverage of um, using cloud computing um, and the different ways that you would, the different advantages, the different ways you can use the different offerings. Excellent reads, both of them. As it says, they're my favourites at the moment. But they've only been out for a few months. You can pre-order the DevOps version of this. It's due out later this year. They've got it down as October the 7th. So it's been hyped up on the web in the, the DevOps uh, forums for quite a while because it follows on from the, the Phoenix uh, story, the parable I was talking about. But the next version of that, um, eight years later, is due out <laughs> in October. And there are new things being discussed in these groups. The next one is likely to be serverless architecture which takes a bit of getting used to when we're used to, whether it's virtual or physical, things living, you, you, you choose an OS, you harden an OS, you keep it up to date, you pen test applications sitting on OSs. But the next step for cloud is front end as a service. No, function as a service and back end as a service, not front end as a service and back end as a service. Now, I've thrown these two up to remind us that security and operations don't always tackle the same things, but they'll use the same tools and the same wording. So monitoring for operations, it's about uptime, it's about availability, it's about scale on demand. But monitoring for security, it's about forensics, it's about alerting on things that are unusual behavior. And these are two classic books on those topics. Um, there are other things, like ITIL has incident management, but you wouldn't consider ITIL's incident, incident management to cover D, DFIR type incident management. So a security management and companies or security consultants and testers are hired for the audit um, of our systems. We won't necessarily think of incident management problem management in the same way operations do. And this is the, the same words, different meanings problem that creates the division between dev and ops and security. Just a quick summary there. Now, um, any questions on my quick tour of what I think DevOps has grown out of? And no is a valid answer. And we can keep going. So I did say I'd drop in a bit that I've seen recently. So I've been focusing on this sort of stuff for about 12, 13 months now in, in my research activity. And I've come across some things I wanted to share with people. So there's some work going on in Adobe, some work going on um, with a guy from Puppet. And the other ones, I think they, um, they meet DevOps and security really well. And so you may have come across them, you may be using something like the DVD security tool. But and you may be going down to DevSecOps. I thought it was worth um, getting, getting it out there to see if it's something that other people would be interested in. Now Puppet have been chosen as the config management tool by the NSA to promote the NSA um, having helped people get to security done better. So they, the NSA now has tools they release in GitHub, you may know. And one of them is SIMP, 
um, fully open source. Um, GitHub open source its own project page. If you're used to using Puppet for config management, then they will give you hardening templates and reporting templates that probably um, map back into the DOD sticks, which are checklists for turning on security um, features of OSs and of applications and general good security logs. So if you didn't know about it, it's worth having a look around. And if you didn't know about it, well, <laughs> sorry. So BDD security, I don't imagine as they, I think they've got their roots in Spain, there'd be anyone in here from BDD security? No. But um, what they've produced is a testing tool that you can talk to using Gherkin style natural language. Now it probably doesn't show up too well in, in, on the back wall, but they, um, you can set up tests that you describe in we're going to test for this, and it must have this, it must have that, in a fairly natural language. And it's taking the idea of test-driven design, test-driven development, TDD, and behavior-driven development to security testing. Now, you don't have to embed this in your um, build pipeline. It's not that kind of security test. It is, uh, it's not, I suppose it's not like a hacking tool, but it, it connects remotely. Um, it, It'll use, it connects remotely, it'll use a mixture of Selenium and Nmap and things under the covers, I imagine, and, and tests an application, but against a natural language list of tests. Um, and I think this getting people to describe a test and then getting a pass or fail in a natural language is going to come up more and more in tools and in security automation for whatever kind of reporting you do. So that's from Continuum Security in Spain. Now, I mentioned Adobe. Adobe, <laughs> people probably hate Adobe's support of Flash, but they might like what their security teams and their internal teams might have to do. They might appreciate just how hard they have to work on their internal environment. And um, their security team have um, added a security config, audit, report layer to one of the config management um, tools, SaltStack, we call it HubbleStack. And they can test Red Hat servers against missing Red Hat patches. They can, that kind of thing, automatically using these tools against massive, massive estates. They can get reports back on 40,000 servers for have you seen this problem before? Have you seen that problem before? Do you meet this security template? So really, really powerful. Only released it to the public in July this year. Um, it's SaltStack's a powerful tool, and HubbleStack on top, with its feeds in of CVE checks and um, vendor vendor checks and open scraps in there as well. Very, very powerful tool where dev and ops and security are working together. And now. Um, this is more, it's a security tool, it's an incident response tool, um, but because it's fast, it scales, it uses a new languages, I thought it fitted in quite well with this talk about dev and ops and security working together. Um, and it's worth looking at if, again, you need, to, um, you need to do security audits of thousands and thousands of servers. And this one will, um, like many incident response workflows, this one will do your hashing and your files and your DNS and stuff. Has anyone played around with Mozilla's me? No. Anyone a BDD security tool? No. It's okay. That's why I put them into bringing your awareness. A DevSecCon. <coughs> Unifying DevOps and security ops. Um, the, the, the guy who launched this last year, it was so successful he's been able to give up his job, start an events company to to create DevSecCon as a, a going concern. Um, I think the next one is October. Yeah, 20th of October in London. And the speakers and the speaker content for this, fascinating. If I was in the country, I'd be there. But... So these are the people involved <coughs> with those last few slides. Um, and the last one. Gareth. Gareth didn't start out Puppet, but has ended up at Puppet. 
and has a huge amount of um, experience in using Puppet as a security auditing tool. So really embedding security in the DevOps process. So different places you can test and fail build based on the test. He um, has demonstrated his ideas for using Puppet, a config management tool that's embedded in the, the build workflow to do security checks for you based on standards and guidelines that are specific to your company. So you describe things a bit like you describe them in BDD. Any questions on that section? No, I don't think so. Just... Oh, bonus section. Right. When it comes to large scale security operations and checks, um, there are commercial offerings that have been around a long time, so they are not DevOps. They, if you've got long relationships with big companies, they will try to sell you these things, and well, with the exception of this new one that was born out of that one. Um, I'm saying there are tools that will do the security operations automatically, workflows and uh, authorizations for you, but I think we as a community can do better with the DevOps approach and the open source software. Now, those, those are all the big brands that uh, have been around with their products for a long time. These are a couple of new players on the market. They're trying to blend the ideas together and make it commercial. Now, Phantom got um, a lot of press at one of the big hackathons um, as a new way of doing things. And this is a workflow, web-based workflow for DFIR work and tying into the alert and SOC and STEM stuff tying into the alerts your security appliances are generating. And NOPSEC is saying that one, one problem you have when you get into vulnerability scanning is you've got masses of results that need, you need help with remediation. So that's the space they're working in. They're working in remediation help, but in tooling. So that they, they don't, there's no service wrapper, there's no humans checking that one, I don't think. Um, but they've seen this opportunity, and I just thought it would bring it people's attention and um, in order for marketing to say we do continuous this or continuous that or remediate this or remediate that they are teaming up with well-known brands like Jira is uh, like a, a well-known bug tracker in, in the DevOps space um, I'm always skeptical when it says continuous you know, remediation or automatic remediation um, sorry if <laughs> People connected with this response. Um, I, I'm, it's a fantastic product, but the marketing, you've got to, anyone who buys security plans, you have to be very careful of the marketing. So now we move into the true DevOps space. Um, and we've got a lot of it is based on after something is checked into um, source control, the idea for continuous integration is that you do your test set. Check in and for continuous deployment, which is where people that this the new thing people are excited about straight into production. You've got to, you you check it out. You build. Does it pass the early build steps? Does it pass the extra test? Can you push it to deploy? Can it all be automated? Automation and orchestration. This is um, this is what the speed side of DevOps is all about. And that image was taken from the Jenkins site. I'll throw up here some of the different areas of the tool that you need to work in that pipeline. Um, and different, different things that are, are coming up as new ways of doing things, um, sometimes. But the ones I've highlighted, the foreman, run deck, ELK. These are ones I think that security teams, security option, ops can get real advantage from. The form is a GUI that will sit on top of most of these config engines. It'll allow you granular logins, you sometimes you see reports, sometimes you can push out changes. And Rundeck is a workflow tool that works with the same under the same under the covers. So with a workflow and a GUI, and a GUI that can read what your config management knows about everything that's phoning home to it, 
give that to security instead of giving that to operations, and they know the state that their estate is in, and they can do, they can embed regular checks and regular activities so that everything is automated, everything is standard, anyone with the right credentials can carry them out out of work photo. And then ELK, collect, log everything, collect all the logs, um, and draw your own dashboards, also really powerful. There was a, a workshop at Black Hat and Def, or Defcon, I can't remember which one it was at, which was focusing on um, using ELK stack for security operations and monitoring. Now, a little bit obscure, because I was going to put in a bonus level. Anyone in the room know what I meant by MAP31? Doesn't matter, it is very, very obscure. It uh, was the hidden level in Doom 2. Um, used to be a favourite of mine. So I wanted to, just again, for, as takeaways, introduce um, a few things. Um, Crafting the Intersect Playbook is a fascinating, pure SecOps look at using uh, a workflow based on a book tracker to collect events, classify events, collect reports, um, and have a, have a way of tracking them through the book tracker of how they were dealt with, do we need to refine our responses and things. It, it is a really good read. And this one is a, a free... Um, free to the world, get my ideas down in a book type book, rather than going to a big publisher. Um, and I've, I've thrown up this quote here. This is someone who's, say, who, who's saying, everyone hates Windows XP. He hasn't updated it for Windows 10. Um, but you can actually make, if you know what you're doing, an XP machine very difficult to compromise. And he's thrown up there. You turn on AppLocker as it's now No. You use um, a sandbox browser, that's that one that launches um, a virtual box to do your browsing. Uh, you install Emmet, you might also install Sysmon. Um, you add AV, everyone knows that, but be very careful about which one you pick. Then you make everyone log in as guest and SU to an account that can do something. And you keep updating the host file with block addresses. So these are things that XP that everyone was so scared of would make it really, really difficult for someone to um, compromise. It, it, they still could, but it would make it difficult. And the reason why this is very security focused, I think the Ruby on Rails would draw away. I've got third edition, it's up in fourth edition. It, it, the four, third and fourth edition are a fascinating look at using online services. The tutorial um, you, you use Bitbucket to move things to Heroku. So the, um, this is Cloud Git, this is Cloud Web Publishing. Um, and it's just a really good read for those people who you know, love playing things. A couple more things in the security ops side. I don't, anyone, anyone using Faraday? Anyone using Fairfix? Someone down here. Fairfix or Faraday? Fairfix. Fairfix. These are a couple of, there's a community version and there's a paid version, um, and they are a way of manipulating your output from lots and lots of tools you might like. So, the big ones, you know, app scan, the little ones, zap, burp, um, skip fish. So, they will take all the different outputs, normalize them, spit them out in reports and dashboards. So, and, in, and the Faraday one in particular is for teams. So you set up a server and all your teams can log into it. If you're running a complicated pen test where uh, you've got splitting up your team to go into different areas of the company, you can use this as a place to consolidate everyone's work that will be able to map the output from any of those tools into your reporting. So it's all about automation, standardization, workflow, but bringing it to the pen tester's toolkit. I think um, if you run team pen testers, it'd be interesting to look into that. And yeah, there are community versions and paid versions. Right, so now, <laughs> I haven't checked the time, but what can we learn from DevOps? Just wanted to say, the next bit, I've yet to see tried. So if you look at uh, the basic ideas behind the... Uh, DevOps, somebody does the work, checks it in, 
then everything gets automated. The, the build tool checks it out, does a build, does the final test, does an automatic deploy. And that, so that's just, that sidebar's there to remind us um, what a great way of automating things that would be. And the security policy. So for information security manager in a company, a company that might be bound by standards like ISO 27001, I wish I didn't have to mention some of these things, but it'll help for this case. You need to do an annual review of your policies and your standards in your, that make up the, the head of your ISMS. What about if you had source control server that you kept your policies in? And what about if you had a branch for author, um, reviewer, so author, QA, authorised to publish, and then publish. The main, main trunk was publish. And you had some simple tests. Must have, uh, must have an author in this field. Must have a reviewer in this field. Dates and versions must have moved on. Um, must be some changes in the document, even if it's just to add those details in the, in the front of the document. So you run some simple tests. And then it gets deployed to your intranet. And then all the logs from your intranet get fed into ELK. And there is a dashboard to see, and a message goes out to your population of users that says, go and see the new policy. And then you can review the dashboard in ELK to say who's gone and clicked on the new document. All these things fit very well in the DevOps learning, but I've never seen it tried using those sort of tools with the security crashes. And then if we look at... So to steer clear of any more references to 27001 or PCI 3.2, how many of you are aware of the NSA's top 10 from their information assurance department? But there are links to um, talks by the NSA um, head of their hacking team about how to keep us off your networks. Obviously, if they want on your networks, they'll be on. Um, so that's just a bit of marketing. But they do produce this top 10 of things to make it harder for hackers. And as whether you're aware of attackers or defenders in the room, we can all see these would make things hard. Application whitelisting, control of admin privileges. I'm not going to read them all now. You can see them. It's in a big font. Um, the ones that are highlighted in yellow are ones that I think this idea of <coughs> checking your changes. So the automatic system checks out changes when it sees there's been a change made, runs some tests, run, runs a build, runs some tests, runs a deploy, Look, send you a report. I think that would work very well with both the training and the turning on in production of application wide um, removal of local admin prints, turning on things like Emmet and extra things in applications. Because most applications, if you get the stick, will allow you to really harden them. Turning on, say, OSEC to any. Anyone come up against OSEC? It's been around a long time. It's a host-based detector, log shipper, OSSC. It's another one that's worth looking into and would really tie in with this uh, tool set. Baseline configs. They have, for years, people have been saying that these are the secure options, the, your sticks and your guides from vendors, and the config management tools will roll them out. And if you run into problems, you can back off the ones, the bits that are giving you problems and mark that change down as an exception. Um, again, I think it's ideal for this DevOps mentality of moving to speed and automation. The ones in purple, I think that's where appliances or uh, tooling would call out to say virus total and the URL side of it. Um, just there are so many different IFC feeds out there. There's so many people that argue whether there's still value in IOCs when you go forensic hunting. But when it comes to helping the users with their web proxies or their email filters, then being tapped into them has got to help. Although the acceptable usage of virus scan might change to prevent that. And then uh, software improvements from the NSA paper is about patching. It's about patching OS, it's about patching applications. And because I think we can all see that they would benefit from this methodology. We'll skip through to another standard. 
How many of you have seen the consensus order guidelines develop into the top 20 critical controls and then now it's ended up with CIS benchmarks? Come across the top 20? Thanks to me. Um, I got on to about version 3, so it's been around a long time, and some of the people on the UK talking circuit have work, worked on it since the beginning. But the CPNI, if anyone, everyone, anyone, no, I'm not going to say anyone not know, because you know it's going to want to put the hand up. The CPNI, um, Centre for Protection of Natural Infrastructure. Anyone work with the CPNI? Anyone work in oil and gas, transport? Sorry, no, I was at the airport for a few years. CPNI is uh, it's a really good organisation if you're in user land rather than vendor space and you need to um, you know, have regular meetings behind closed doors to talk about security concerns. You can imagine with ports and airports, there's a physical side, but cyber, I hope you like the word cyber, is um, on the, is, is on everyone's risk register, so it's important. And they adopted critical controls. And so if you're not mandated to have ISO for whatever, and you're not taking car details, so you're not being chased with PCR, this is an excellent set of security controls. In a, there are sub-controls of the 20 that come up. Um, it is a really, really good place to go if you don't want to invest in ISO. Uh, version 6 is through to CIS. And it will come up again in a moment. There's the, there's the 20 headlines. But I keep coming back to the NSA. I do not work for the NSA. I have no interest in what they do. But they do provide some great guidance. Um, and the management, management network plan is actually a project plan to deliver the top of critical controls. And many of those could benefit from source code repository, builds, automatic build tool, DevOps pipeline, tests, test driven development. The, the trying these ideas or updating them could all be embedded with that. And then you have evidence that you did what you said you were going to do. And it was in the logs from all the tools. Another great set of um, mitigation strategies, what they call it. Um, so they started theirs in 2012, there was a new version in 2014. The NSA copied them in 2013, so, so good. So you can see there's a lot of overlap. Um, application whitelisting, keeping patches up to date. Because it's from a much bigger list, it can, sp it can split out operating system maps, applications. Excellent from a defence point of view, and the uh, the site that promotes this uh, this standard has a chart of how easy or difficult a business will adopt changes to do things like application whitelisting and removal of local admins. So you know, some red flags for some of it. So there's a lot of overlap there with with the other the top ten, but because they split theirs out, there's some others that could. Um, work very well with the automatic deployment and the monitoring for changes in the uh, source code repository. Host-based firewall, USB control. All these things that companies are often scared to try, um, but if you did try, a lot of your problems would go away. Um, so by using, we have a test environment, we have tests that you can see in the testing tool, you can add confidence to, to management that this is a well thought out, well planned, it's repeatable, it can be done in a hurry by someone who just has the right login. All these things would really help the adoption of these standards that would really help the defenders keep the, the crap off the networks. So to just summarise that last section, um, I think many of the, the practical security controls that should be deployed in an organization, whether it's someone developing a web app or whether it's protecting the hosts in a large office environment, could benefit from person making the decision, checking it in at the start of a DevOps pipeline. So security templates, however it's done, Active Directory, Puppet, Chef, there is all the information you need to build secure concrete. You might want to try them in different environments, this DevOps pipeline will allow you to do that. Hips and firewall tuning, app wide listing. App Locker and SRP, you can put them in later versions of Windows, you can put them in learning mode 
you ship the logs off somewhere and find out you're not going to break anything by turning it on and then turning it on and all the evidence will be captured in your DevOps pipeline. Patching, patching, monitoring. These are all things that you get a lot of resistance in a business from. No matter what the hosts are, developers might be on Macs and Ubuntu, your, your office might be on XP still in some places. You get a lot of resistance from the business about patches break things, or it's app, app locker breaks things. But this would give you the evidence that you had tested, it wasn't going to break anything, and then you could make tweaks and it would be automatically deployed everywhere without breaking it. So, quick slide upon the, the template. So, hopefully, the, the title that drew you in, thank you very much for staying, some people couldn't. <laughs> um, it's a culture about speed and scale and automation and working together to deliver business goals, which is very different from the old silos and, and tribes um, that, we, that we know of all. Um, the check-in, check-out, test, deploy, back out, log, report, all of that from a DevOps pipeline, I think is ideally suited for doing security better. The automation side of it has been maturing for over 10 years. So we need to put together evidence that it works more than it doesn't work to beat down the business side who say they don't want to try something new. And there is a growing DevSecOps community um, where developers interested in security are coming together and that's where this DevSecOps movement is growing out of. And if you, if you do nothing else, I would just have a look at BDD tool and what Gareth has said about bringing um, security policy, security standards, security updates into your config management system. Very smart guy. Um, moved to Puppet based on his love of Puppet. Time is precious. I am the slot before lunch. Um, thank you very much for coming along, um, listening, not heckling. And uh, we do, I, I didn't have a look at the but I imagine we've got a few minutes if anyone's got any questions. If it's not the about questions, I'll be hanging around for a bit if you want to have a chat. There is a question here and here, we'll get to those. I will share the slides, um, if that is of any use to anyone, I'll give them to the organisers and I'll put them up on my slideshow. So two hands to, went up to start with, I'll start with one in the middle and then we will try and get through some more. So in my personal opinion, okay. I believe one of the main challenges in DevOps environment is speed. So developers are forced to develop functionality as speed as they can. Right. So this is all about speed going into production, automation and everything. So do you have any solution like a, a developers to think like a secure functioning or secure coding or implement the secure, so you mentioned many vendors or many automation pipeline methods yes. and everything. There are a lot of people discussing and a lot of people experimenting with the different sort of test phases, the tests that check in and the tests you already build to include security checks. Now, what I'm saying is nothing about testing. So I know BBD right. security is there for testing purpose. There are many other testing uh, tools or vendors are for, for continuous integration, continuous development, testing. But it's a security requirement, security functionality. So I will give you an example. Yeah. Uh, the developers ask to implement the authentication login mechanism. So he don't know there is a brute force attack. So he need to implement the functionality like a, okay uh, lockout mechanism. Maybe right. he need to block mechanism. So he know how to code, but he don't know he need to implement it. So these kind of challenges like. A, uh, developers may not always think like a misuse case, so they always yes. think use cases, yeah. and they develop based on the use cases. So, like misuse case or whatever. Else. That that's a great point. Now, now what is there a question in there that I can answer? Because I do know that lots of uh, sort of security consultancies who build source code analyzers will offer training to developers to stop them making the same mistakes over and over again. I also know that there are people who have productized that knowledge and embedded it into a knowledge base in the tool. Um, so people have seen commercial op op 
opportunities in that problem. The developer knows how to bring in logs, but doesn't know how to trigger on a brute force attack. You can teach them about it, I'm, I'm sure. And there are people who have seen that as an opportunity and adding context-aware training. I can think of two companies, but I'm not here to promote companies. Yeah. I, so I do agree that training, of course, it will help. But there is also a, it's a vendor who is offering this kind of solution, like a, this is kind of automatic. So for a DevOps environment, you just give the functionality what you needed to develop or something. It will generate the security requirements, security functionalities you need to implement, and post Jira. The one you already mentioned, Container security, they have a product called Iris Risk. So, Stephen, so yeah. they do have this solution. Risk. Yeah, I've, I've come across it in my research as well of other people tackling that problem. Now, some other hands went up, and Lloyd is back. So, uh, what, how, what's the timeline? You're fine, you've got 15 minutes. Oh, I've the, the, the queue for lunch. The, the, food, the food is starting to appear. Right. <laughs> there were two more hands up, and this one went up first. To be fair, it was, it was a bit of an extension of that, really. You think that all wasp, which is there for the SDRC side, you against any experience around how to, to really embed security in that core creation piece. What, that's really, really lucky what I have seen, um, one of the tools that I've put up on the page of tool names that has a community version or is 9973 is SonarQ. So that's in competition with some of the vendors also going on. And I've seen people embed that in Jira, which is a popular bug tracker that is to come act as new development can test, ready to build um, workflow and ticketing system. So I've seen people bring Jira and SonarQ together and make it a mandatory step to pass um, pass security templates in Sonar View. Seen that done. And also in the middle of the, the first section, my version of the history of DevOps, I think when I got to about 2012, I put up some slide shares or some YouTubes where they were talking to you about DevOps and Sec, Data Sec Ops and all that. Those guys were discussing how to get security training both into developers and tooling to add into the chain to, to help you. Especially like that VDD that uses Gherkin to talk in the natural language. So, although that is an external testing tool, if you embedded that in that, you could write your own um, security tests in that. And the work from Gareth, the puppet, if you look at some of his on the speaker deck, he has tackled this problem of getting security requirements into tests because Puppet has a, a, a do you meet the requirement section to it. So it's things like is is there only 25 of them on a, an internal mail server? And these kind of questions they'll test every port and fail if there's anything else. And that kind of thing are embedded in some of the stuff. So if you get a copy of the slides and go and look it up with the names of the people and the slide decks and these, you'll find there's a lot of research going <coughs> into it. Does that help? Yeah, that's good. I'll do one here and I'll come to the well, first of all, just quickly in response to that, um, I'm an ex-sys admin, I've still got a strong interest in DevOps, so I can see it from that side of the fence. And one of the things about DevOps is that it is very much cultural, it's not just technological. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly one of the ways that some organisations are approaching it is that they are creating dedicated product-based teams, and they're including all of the uh, disciplines in the teams related to a product rather than departmentalizing the organization and yeah. then trying to cross feed the information between departments. That's one approach. Um, and that does seem to be working for some people. So it brings people in at the early, it brings security in at the earliest design stages, which is the important thing, which yeah. is always the problem we've had in development anyway. I think that might have been a quote I used out of the book from 2008. <laughs> yeah, well. Even further before that. Um, the other thing is, I just wanted to mention is that um, I don't know if you know, but the BCS is at the process in the, in the process of constituting a, a SIG for DevSecOps at the moment. I didn't. I, I'm, I'm, BCS do a lot of fantastic work, so if they've actually convened a group to say, let's put something out to help. Yeah. Some of the leading lights in the British DevOps world are pushing this from within the BCS. No. But obviously, the BCS being BCS, they required that security brought on, be brought on board as well. So it is actually going to be a DevSecOps group. That, that, 
Right, and the ones with no hands up over here? Yeah, just to say, um, kind of following on from I think, the, the toolbox that you presented to us, um, in terms of embedding stuff organisationally and keeping track of those tools and mixing the kind of the people and the tech, um, far be it from me to throw another standard into the mix, and it's not really a standard anyway, but there's um, a thing called the Trustworthy Software Framework, uh, which has a number, PAS754, which I would recommend people to have a look at because it uh, helps to join a lot of dots together. Yeah. Very, very good point. People often look at the ISO and the probably want an overcomplicated one to tackle some areas of quality of this, but the PAS as well. Um, great point. That's up. Right, anyone think about any fresh questions? If not, we can join the food team or be in the front of the food team.